Hi, my name is Colin Klanis and you're watching the video on the ACA and PCA ratio. In this video, we will discuss how we determine a patient's ACA and PCA ratio. So just as part of revision, let's go over what is the ACA ratio. The ACA ratio is the total amount of accommodative convergence a patient undertakes for each diopter of accommodation. And we expect that for individuals with a normal ACA ratio, they will do somewhere between three to five prism diopters worth of accommodative convergence for every diopter of accommodation. Over here to the right, we see an image where a patient is looking at a distant uh, object and then changes the fixation target to a near object. Let's say as an example, there is a change of one diopter of accommodation between those two distances. Well, if the patient has a three to one ratio for the ACA, what we expect is that there will be an increase of three diopters of accommodative convergence as the patient looks near. And as the patient looks further away, there'll be a decrease in three diopters of accommodative convergence. Okay, if there was a change in two diopters between those two differences, we would double those numbers. There'd be a change of six diopters and so on. Okay, what about the PCA ratio? PCA ratio relates to the sense of nearness. So for every diopter of accommodation, we will induce a certain amount of proximal convergence. Now this is relatively low, and here we see that somewhere between one to three diopters of proximal convergence occurs with every diopter of accommodation. So again, if we take the example here, if we're, we have a change between the distance image and the near image of one diopters, and we have a ratio of two to one, then what we expect is to see that two diopters of proximal convergence will occur with that change from distance to far. So we'll see an increase of two diopters going from far to near and a decrease going from near to far. So how do we go about calculating an individual's ACA or PCA ratio? We do this by measuring the deviation and measuring the deviation at near and far. Now measuring the deviation between near and far, what we're doing is we're changing the level of accommodation. We're assessing it at six meters, which let's say simulates infinity, versus a third of a meter where we're accommodating by three doctors, assuming we're an emetrope. So what we're seeing is a change between far and near of about three doctors. What we can also do is manipulate accommodation through utilization of trial lenses. So if I, for instance, ask the patient to look at a near target at a third of a metre, I know the patient is doing three doctors of accommodation at that distance, then what I can do is introduce plus lenses to relax the accommodation by three doctors, and therefore induce a change in accommodation whilst maintaining the distance. Generally speaking, at near, you would use plus lenses to relax the accommodation, and at far, if you introduce lenses, you would introduce minus lenses to induce accommodation. So in order for us to calculate the ACA ratio, we need three measurements. The PCT at near, the PCT at far, and one PCT measurement where we have manipulated the accommodation, whether it's we've induced accommodation or relaxed it, so you can do either plus at near or minus at far, but you need one of those measurements to be able to then calculate the patient's ACA and PCA. A couple of other points related to measuring the ACA and PCA ratio. One is that you must, must, must use an accommodative target during testing and ensure that your patient is able to identify the accommodative target. So if you're using letters, they should be able to identify the letters of that accommodative target. Now the reason we do this is that we want to have some confidence that the patient is accommodating for that distance appropriately. 
So as an example, if at a third of a metre, I introduce plus three lenses to relax the accommodation by three diopters, I need some proof that the patient has indeed relaxed their accommodation by three diopters. And what I know is that if they have indeed accommodated or relaxed their accommodation by three diopters, they should see those letters clearly. If they are struggling to see those letters and they're blurred, then I know that they haven't done the required relaxation. Now you can give the patient a few moments to see if they can relax their accommodation. And if they can't, you must change the lenses to a less power. So to plus 250, to plus 2, etc. And I generally reduce by about a half a diopter until the patient is able to relax their accommodation in this specific example and see the letters clearly. And this is really important because as we'll see in a moment, with the formulas for the ACA and the PCA ratio, we're dividing by the amount of accommodation that the patient is doing. And so if I've underestimated or overestimated the amount of accommodation that a patient is doing, then my calculation will be contaminated. Now there are two methods to calculating the ACA, the gradient method and the heterophoria method. The gradient method gives us the ACA ratio of the patient. We perform the heterophoria method in order to then calculate the PCA ratio. Let's start off with the gradient method. What we're doing with the gradient method is we're maintaining the patient's fixation at a certain distance. So as an example, here we have the patient looking at a far fixation target or a fixation target in the distance, and the prism cover test is being performed. What we'll then do is repeat this at the same distance, but with lenses, I will put up minus three lenses, ensure that the patient can see the smallest letters clearly, and then proceed to measuring the angle of deviation using the PCT with the minus three lenses on. For the heterophoria method, what we're doing is we're simply changing distance. We're comparing the patient's angle of deviation or the PCT result in the distance where they're accommodating less versus their PCT result or size of deviation when they're fixing at a near target at a third of a metre, so where they're doing three diopters. So in the heterophoria method, I have a change in accommodation due to a change in the distance versus in the gradient method, I have a change in accommodation due to the lenses. However, because the heterophoria method relies on a change in the distance, IPD will be a factor because IPD relates back to the amount of convergence that we need to undertake. So this IPD will have to be taken into account in our formula. In addition to this, and this is why we cannot use the heterophoria method as the ACA ratio, by changing the distance that the patient is fixing on, we're changing the sense of nearness. Which means that if we were to take the heterophoria method as the ACA ratio, it would be contaminated by the PCA ratio. It's also contaminated by a tonic convergence because there's more tonic convergence at near as compared to at far or infinity. Now, we don't have a way of measuring tonic convergence, so we don't concern ourselves so much with that. But the issue is that the heterophoria method is contaminated by proximal convergence, which is why we utilise it to then work out the PCA ratio. Let's now take a look at these formulas and how we go about calculating the ACA ratio. So we said earlier that the gradient method is how we calculate the ACA ratio. So what we're doing here is we'll compare when the patient accommodated most in prism doctors from the PCT versus when they accommodated least. And then we'll divide by the amount of accommodation we either exerted or, um, or induced or relaxed. So in the example earlier, I said that the patient was being assessed in the distance without glasses, and then we put up minus three lenses. So what we need to work out is which PCT result is it 
that the patient is accommodating most. And in this instance, it's with the minus threes when we've induced accommodation. So the minus three PCT, or the PCT with the minus three lenses, will go first, subtracted from the PCT with no correction. And then we divide by the lens value. So if we put up three doctors and the patient could see clearly with three doctors, then we would divide by three. Earlier I said that if they couldn't see the target clearly, this is where the issue lies, that you would end up dividing by three when indeed the patient was probably doing far less than three doctors of accommodation because they couldn't actually see the target. So you'd end up dividing by a higher value than, than what was necessary and again, you'll have an ACA ratio that's incorrect. Now had we used plus lenses instead at NIA, then what would have happened was that we would have taken the, the PCT without correction first, as this would have been when the patient was accommodating more, and we would have subtracted it from the PCT with the plus lenses, which is when the patient relaxes their accommodation, and then divide that by the value of the lens that we presented to the patient. Okay, so that gives us the ACA ratio. Because we've kept the distance stable, it's not contaminated by proximal virgins. We then proceed to calculate the heterophoria method, which in this instance is when the patient accommodates most, which is at near, and we subtract the when the patient is accommodating least, which is at far. So the PCT at near, PCT at far, and we divide by three doctors. We divide by three specifically because we assume that the test was done at infinity, which is zero accommodation, versus performed at a third of a metre, which is three diopters, and there's a change there of three diopters of accommodation. And then we add the patient's IPD in centimetres. Okay, to work out the PCA ratio, we subtract the gradient ACA from the heterophoria ACA. And the reason we do this is because the heterophoria ACA is contaminated by the PCA whilst the gradient is not. So by subtracting one from the other, we will gain knowledge of what the PCA ratio is. Okay, let's take a look at a case example. Here we have a patient with a distance with a left exotropia of eight diopters, at near an exophoria of two diopters, and at far through minus three lenses, an exophoria of three doctors. So to measure the ACA using the gradient method, we'll need to take the measurement with the lenses on, so the one at far, and compare it to the PCT result at that same distance, which is eight. Let's put that into the formula. So here we have the gradient method. We have minus three, which is the uh, PCT result in the distance, and we have minus because it's an exo deviation, minus minus eight, which gives us a plus eight. Eight being the deviation at far. Divided by three, which is the lens we used. Okay, that gives us a five on three, which is a 1.7 to one ratio. Now, for the heterophoria method, we want to compare near and far. So when they're accommodating more at near versus when they're accommodating less at far. So here's the formula for that. We've got minus two when they're accommodating more at near, minus minus eight when they're accommodating less at far, and the two minuses make a plus. We divide by three and we add six for their IPD. So it's six on three plus six and we end up with an eight to one. So overall the gradient method indicates that the patient has an ACA ratio of 1.7 to 1. So for every one doctor of accommodation, the patient does 1.7 doctors of accommodative convergence. And for the PCA ratio, we subtract the gradient method from the Fourier method, and we end up with an 8 minus 1.7, which equates to 6.3 to 1. So if we were to compare these values to the norms, we can see that the ACA ratio is low because we expect a 3 to 5, and we can see that the PCA ratio is high because we expect 1 to 3. Okay, before we conclude, I want to mention why and when we measure an ACA or PCA ratio.
The reason is that we're finding a near distance disparity in the angle of deviation. What this means is that there's a significant change between the angle of deviation at near and far. So as an example, if I have an exo deviation, that's 10 prism doctors at near, but at far is 30 prism doctors, there's a difference there that I need to begin to explore as to why it exists. And what we should look for is to determine whether the ACA or the PCA ratio is the reason for the difference between the near and distance PCT. We'll come back to this more when we start to talk about exo deviations and exo deviations and which are affected by the ACA ratio or the PCA ratio. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.